What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Lately I've seen some requests for a new Skyrim build so today I'm here to deliver the goods with a brand new creation, the Pact Maker. We have done a huge job on the backstory and roleplaying sections of the build so we really hope you enjoy it. Legends tell great stories of those as omniscient as the Daedra being outwitted. Sometimes it is by another Daedric Prince such as Shia Gorath, outwitting others in various contests, be it in a duel of champions beasts against Hercene or winning a wager against Veamina. Mortals too have been lucky enough to fool the Daedra. The Night Mistress Nocturnal had her very own cow stolen by a thief, a legendary one at that but mortal nonetheless. And now we come to the Pact Maker, an imperial man who has managed to outwit Clavicus File at his own game over and over again. But before we begin the build, I want to tell you that we have been fortunate enough to have a sponsor for this video, which is very exciting for us in terms of how much time we could actually spend on this build. You've probably never heard of Raid Shadow Legends, a very popular mobile RPG that you can play on mobile and even on your desktop. Raid Shadow Legends is a visually stunning fantasy game with a heavy focus on training the right team of champions to slay all the foes who stand in your way. As big lovers of characters with awesome aesthetics, we can really say there are many cool champion designs in the game. I also particularly like the strategic aspect to not only building the right team, but choosing which powers to use and when. You also unlock different pieces of gear which you can upgrade and when you unlock champions you don't want, you can actually sacrifice them to power up the ones you do like, which is pretty evil but 100% worth it. The campaign has a fully voiced story but there's also other modes such as a PvP arena, faction wars and a clan boss mode where you can fight a boss with your friends and win rewards. You'll want their username and as you can see mine is Fudge Killer. And now the Battle Pass Season 1 is live allowing you to get even more rewards so what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special special links and if you're a new player within the next 30 days you'll get a bonus of 100,000 silver, 2 clan boss keys, 10 mystery shards and a free rare champion, the executioner. From what I understand he's pretty useful early on. You can find all the treasure up here. With that all said and done, let's get hyped for the newest Skyrim build, the Pact Maker. The Pact Maker is imbued with the powers of a Daedric Prince and the talent to make deals that bring him great benefit. One can only imagine the kind of power he'll be able to wield over other mortals, people who will readily help him ascend to power without realizing they are often taking the fall for his personal gain. The Pact Maker will not only find his way to be powerful mentally and politically, but also in combat, gaining proficiency in swordsmanship and conjuration magic through diligent training and also through the gifts he unlocks by fulfilling packs with Clavicus Vile. He'll find every possible loophole to ensure nothing sinister befalls him, and in a way he's similar to the Daedric Prince he so often overcomes, though instead of his actions coming from a place of amusement or personal satisfaction, they stem from a desire to be powerful within his mortal lifespan. This build will be a fun challenge at times due to the various packs you actually have to complete for Clavicus Vile via the Faiths mod we're using. Mods will be explained as they're relevant, and the full mod list is in the description below along with the timestamps in case you want to jump between big sections. Now let's dive into the race, standing stone stats and faith of this build. The Pact Maker is an Imperial, and while we are using the Imperious Races of Skyrim mod, Imperials do still begin with 100 points in all their stats and have 300 carry weight. Health regen is 1% per second, 3% for Magicka and 5% for Stamina. More interestingly, you'll get some cool race specific bonuses. With Discipline, allies in armed combat within 15 feet will gain 150 points of armor and 15% attack damage. In combat, Imperial Virtues will allow you to regenerate a random stat, either Health, Magicka or Stamina, 100 100% faster until combat ends. There's also a quest reward power called Colovian Star, which simply unlocks after you complete 20 quests for the people of Skyrim. Once a day you can invoke the Emperor to refill Magicka and Stamina and fortify them by the amount restored for 30 seconds. There's also a unique Imperial bonus known as the Human Spirit, however, we're going to roleplay that this is instead a group of permanent bonuses gained from Clavicus Vile for fulfilling special packs with him. So what this bonus does is allow you to make permanent changes to your attributes, resistances, or skills at level 10, 20, and 30. So at level 10, we'll choose to gain 100 points of Magicka and lose 50 points from Stamina. The drawback represents Clavicus Files' intentions with the Pact, but the Pact 
Maker coming out on top with an overall win numbers wise represents his ability to rise above and end up a winner in any deal. The magic is a gift from Vile and was a true necessity to allow the Pact Maker to be proficient with his spells. At level 20 we'll choose to increase frost resistance by 50% and lose 25% poison resistance. We chose this because frost drains stamina and we'll want it for any power attacks we use but also because frost slows us down and it's a common damage type. It's also cool to think Clavicus managed to curse the Pact Maker with some kind of poison vulnerability. At level 30 you get to choose a skill to add points to and minus points to from combat magic and thief skills. We choose to buff one handed, conjuration and speech or light armor if you want but it really depends where your skills are at at the time. Obviously for skills to reduce just pick ones you don't even use. While the Pact Maker isn't the romantic loving type, he will be using the Lover Standing Stone. Due to the Andromeda unique Standing Stones of Skyrim mod, this comes with some unique effects. The first is the Secret Admirer bonus. The Lover will periodically gift you a random enchanted weapon or piece of armor. You can disenchant these to help with your enchanting skill, but apart from that it will also help to buff your speech skill and make you more septums as you can sell the items to vendors. There's also an unlockable power called Lover's Kiss that allows you to magically bond someone to you to call them to your location when desired. The final bonus to mention is known as Undying Love, and this allows you to cheat death when slain, returning to life with full health, and that has a 15 minute cooldown, and you don't have to, but we like to roleplay that this is also related to Clavicus Vile, and that he's keeping you around to continue on making packs and deals with him so that he may one day best you and trick you. He wouldn't want you to die outside of his control or his fun would end. As for his faith, we're going to be choosing to follow Clavicus Clavicus Vile. The Pact Maker has an interesting relationship with Vile. He follows the Daedric Prince, completing his requests and benefiting greatly, and yet Clavicus would love nothing more than to derail his life as a result of an unforeseen consequence of one of their many agreements. This build uses the Winter Sun Faiths of Skyrim mod to help roleplay this relationship. To unlock the worship, you'll need to complete Clavicus Vile's quest in Skyrim. His Shrine Blessing makes Conjuration spells cost 10% less to cast, which is perfect for the Pact Maker. As a follower, you'll have the Pact Maker effect, making conjuration spells and effects last 10% longer in general. The more you pray to Clavicus File, the more favor you build up. Upon reaching 100% favor, you'll become a devotee, gaining the Wishmaster ability, allowing you to pray to make a wish, permanently granting you an additional perk point. This costs 30% favor. Now, when you pray, you'll have to accept a pact from the Daedric Prince and complete it within the allotted time. You should never break or ignore one of Vile's packs. There's a long list of tasks you may be asked to do. From more mundane ones such as win two brawls within one hour and read three skill books in one hour to more grave requirements like contract three diseases within one hour, commit five murders within one hour, or five assaults, or accumulate 1,500 more lifetime bounty within one hour. You get the idea. Find a way to sort it out and complete his perks and you'll be getting lots of power in the form of new perks. I think there's about 30 to 35 different tasks you may be challenged with in total, and feel free to go beyond the perks we recommend in this video when you get more than you need through these packs. For the stat spread, you'll want to go 50% health and 50% stamina up until level 10, which you reach pretty quickly. At this stage, you'll roleplay that you're making that pact with Clavicus File when given the option to fortify stats, choosing to put 100 into Magicka at the cost of losing 50 from stamina. That gives you 200 Magicka, so your prowess truly feels like a gift from Vile and not due to your own innate power. Spellcasting will be fortified more through certain enchanted items we're using. From then on, follow a health, health, stamina pattern for the rest of the game to stay powerful and hard to kill while slowly becoming deadlier with your sword due to one-handed perks that benefit from stamina. The Pact Maker was born in Cyrodiil in the 180th year of the Fourth Era, just five years after the end of the Great War. He was an identical twin and the son of a noble Nibonese family of Breville, a city still recovering from being captured by the Old Miri Dominion eight years prior. He his family had escaped just weeks before Lord Narafin besieged the city, taking refuge in one of their small estates nestled by the river banks to the west. The Pact Maker's father was a well-respected man and had grown the family's wealth tremendously by investing his father's money in the creation of various luxury goods. He invested into farmland for the production of silk, used to manufacture high-end clothing, furniture and bedding, and his interest in agricultural business extended even to the farming of various plants used for expensive perfumes. In the times before the Great War, these decisions appeared to be wise, with the family generating more money than ever before. However, by the time the Pact Maker grew up, his family had become quite destitute, at least as far as income was concerned.
burned. Much of the farmland they owned had been ravaged by the Great War, and now because the father had heavily leveraged his deals by borrowing too much money, he didn't have the income to afford his repayments, and was forced to sell his investments at a huge loss. The father was never one to read the fine print or care for insurance. He was high risk, high return, although in quite a careless way, obviously. The family still had their manor in Breville and all their noble trappings, but the true wealth that provided all of this in the first place had diminished greatly and was still evaporating. As the pact maker grew up, he saw his father constantly squabbling to find ways to rebuild their riches, but his attempts seemed mostly futile. He wished there was something he could do about it. When the pact maker was just eight years old, his city of Breville, which on top of being ravaged by the Great War, was already known as a shadier, poorer place with more criminals compared to other cities, erupted into violence. Two skooma kingpins clashed with each other in an all-out war, a Dunma group known as the Eclipse and a Khajiit group known as the Claws. When trouble began to break out, the pact maker was in the marketplace buying food, helping a high-ranking guard who worked for the family to carry the supplies. The pact maker's twin brother was thankfully in the castle, spending most of his time there being groomed by other nobles to be a steward to the count. His brother was very lucky in this regard and was scouted out by people high up in the political workings of the castle when one noble found him studying a complicated text in the city library. The pact maker considered himself as smart as his twin brother, but he was not one to be stuck into books all day long, and was never given a similar opportunity. With his brother seen as the golden child, the pact maker spent most of his time forced to do whatever his parents wanted him to. Sometimes that meant going down to the markets to buy food that his mother would now prepare instead of a chef, and other times it meant being forced to spend time with a family friend or relative. His father may have squandered their wealth, but they still had contacts and certain favors owed to them. One favor owed to the family actually involved this high-ranking guard named Varanus, who was paying off a debt to the father he owed after failing to repay a small loan given to him while the family was in prosperous times. His job was to protect the family and teach the pact maker and his brother how to fend for themselves with unarmed self-defense tactics and also how to wield a wooden sword. Many of the city's richest also had various forms of cell swords to protect their properties, and this proved very useful during the riots. Sadly for the pact maker, himself and the guard were caught in a precarious spot, trapped between the family home and the marketplace, with rioters beginning to storm through on either side. In the chaos, the guard was pushed aside and the pact maker trampled to the ground, his face smashed against the corner of some cobblestone steps as a mob trampled over his body. The pact maker awoke to sounds of violence in the streets, though quickly realized he was hearing this from the safety of his own home. There he was tended to, while much of Breville was burnt down by rioters, leaving the city a shadow of its already diminished former self. For the rest of his life, the pact maker would have a heavily scarred, disfigured face. Even worse, he had to deal with seeing his twin brother grow up to be a handsome young fellow, successful in the courts, and so snobby that he eventually would want nothing to do with the family who had always loved him. Much to the disappointment of the family, he even decided to live in the castle, so indoctrinated by the other nobles that he viewed his family as pathetic and unworthy. While jealous, the pact maker mourned the loss of his brother to the aristocratic lifestyle of the castle, but over time would grow to resent him for such betrayal. The pact maker also found that his own parents grew far less fond of him due to his disfigurement, despite still taking care of him. He had use after all, and while they may have viewed him somewhat shamefully, they still loved him. It would be fair to say they were quite shallow people. To some, the pact maker's ugliness made him invisible, and to others a curiosity. Many people still knew he was his father's son, and he'd often hear murmuring the moment he walked past groups on the street. It became hard to make friends with others, and even people who were once friendly slowly distanced themselves. By the time he had entered his teenage years, the pact maker was a true outcast, and soon discovered that the guard, Varanus, had finished paying off his debt to the family. Varanus was one of the only people he considered a friend these days. He had become quite close to him over the years, though after one final lesson where they practiced with wooden swords in the basement area of the family manor, Varanus said his official goodbye. Sometimes the two would see each other around the city and enjoy talking about how their lives were going, but for the most part, the young pact maker's relationship with his mentor became more distant than ever before. However, it wasn't long before the pact maker made a new friend. During a trip to the marketplace, now on his own and armed with an actual sword, the pact maker noticed that a new merchant had set up shop with a stall that sold jewelry and other ornaments. He was a pale Breton man as tall as a Nord, wearing an ornate purple and white robe, along with a variety of rings, each possessing a flawless gemstone. 
A nearby guard kept a keen eye on the stall, making sure no one tried their luck at stealing such valuable loot. Walking past the Breton, the pact maker couldn't help but stare at this new man. He was dressed like an artwork, and his wares looked equally as fascinating. The pact maker saw the Breton looking at him and drawn in by his piercing bright blue eyes, walked his way as the merchant yelled out for him to come over. Nice to meet you, I'm Korok, seller of all trinkets beautiful, life-changing, and priceless. I couldn't help but notice the particularly unique features of your face, and I think I have something that could really help you out. The pact maker was stunned at the straightforwardness of the man. He wasn't being rude or hurling insults at him, but he had no hesitation in pointing out something that the pact maker was truly ashamed of. Regardless, the pact maker would do almost anything to restore his face to how it used to be. Tell me more, he inquired. And so began a series of events, specifically a string of deals that would culminate in the pact maker building a strong relationship with Korok and developing into the ultimate deal maker. Korok knew that the pact maker didn't have much money to buy things, so he instead asked him to do certain tasks in exchange for a reward. Often he'd even make little bets with the pact maker for fun, sometimes tricking him into losing before the outcome was even clear. Korok taught the pact maker a lot doing this, and the two were having great fun. He told him that one day he may be able to make him a mask that will make everyone like him, and such popularity would do wonders for his damaged self-esteem. He'd made the mask for someone before, but the costs were high, so the pact maker would have to work hard for it. For now, rewards for work would still be given that were smaller and more necessary. Septums, for example, helped pay for food and acted as a step for the pact maker to rebuild his family's wealth, a goal he had always dreamed of. His inheritance was practically nothing, but that wouldn't stop him from one day building his family up to where they used to be. He also carried a chip on his shoulder due to his brother and wanted to show him that he was capable of success too. As a teenager, the tasks and rewards from Korok were quite simple. You could almost say that Korok gained the pact maker's trust by making him run simple errands and treating him well, pick up supplies, deliver a necklace to another noble's house, even clean Korok's stall after a long day. The pact maker grew close to the Breton. He acted as a new kind of mentor, always teaching him through their little betting games and also talking to him about how to sell things to customers, how to play into their psychology and give them the feeling they wanted, not the item itself. Sure, Breville was still recovering as the pact maker grew older, but it was amazing how Korok managed to convince people to buy such flashy wares during these harder times. Eventually, the pact maker was given a unique gift for his service, a special ring. It had an enchantment on it that Korok said would boost your personality and make others like you a bit more. The pact maker found that the effects were not dramatic. He still wanted Korok to one day make him a mask like the one he talked about in the beginning, but for now this ring was still appreciated. The pact maker remained unsightly to most, but he noticed the murmurs died down a bit, and a slightly more neutral look in many of the eyes that gazed upon him. In very rare instances that truly melted his heart, he could sometimes get a little smile from a passerby. He yearned for such moments, and it's of no surprise that this ring really hooked the pact maker to the rewards of Korok, who continued to teach him life lessons. Growing into a young adult, the pact maker had managed to save up a nice sum which he planned to act like his father with, although much more diligently. He would invest it to help his family regain wealth, although he did so in Korok's business. With the pact maker's investment, Korok had amassed just enough wealth to occupy a proper store space, renting out a building in the city. It was now that Korok knew the pact maker was all in, and decided he was mature and dedicated enough for a more severe task. He decided to put a competitor out of business, a general goods store who also sold some trinkets, though much cheaper ones, passing them off as more special than they actually were. It was an unethical business practice, however, for the most part, the business was still legitimate. The pact maker felt a bit of guilt about the idea, however, now he was truly tied up in Korok's success, so there was a lot of benefit to the decision. He was to sneak in at night time and swap out multiple rings for enchanted ones that looked identical identical, but would cause the wearer harm. He had no idea how identical copies of the rings were made, or how much harm they'd cause, but he couldn't afford to care. He really wanted his investment to pay off, and he needed this mask from Korok. As bonus compensation, Korok also offered the pact maker a special dagger up front. He said it had a luck enchantment on it that made it easier for it to always find the weak spot in its target. The pact maker accepted the dagger just in case he needed something small and lethal, and of course, it could could be kept after the task was complete. Under the cover of night, the pact maker passed through the streets of Breville with a cow draped over his head. Skooma dealers, addicts, and other dodgy individuals
individuals clung to the dim corners of the city, but hardly anyone was found near the markets except a guard or two on patrol. The pact maker was never one to be stealthy, but the dagger at his side had him feeling very confident. He felt particularly lucky tonight. Using a key that Korok had somehow gotten his hands on, the pact maker pushed the back door open carefully and snuck into the store. It was very hard to see with the only light coming from the moons outside, however he could tell the place was well kept. As he made his way into the store, he found the rings that looked identical to those that Korok gave him, and swapped them out, pocketing the originals for himself. As he went to leave, a shadow passed by the back window, and a voice yelled into the store, demanding to know, who's there? He must have been followed. The clinking sound of Breville Guard armor made its way into the back room, with the pact maker crouched right behind the door that had now been opened again. He took the dagger from his side, which had begun to pulsate and vibrate aggressively in his grasp, though he wanted to avoid conflict at all costs, planning to leave as soon as the guard would venture further inside. The figure took a few steps inside, but before the pact maker could wait for a chance to escape, the dagger began to glow bright orange and ripped him to his feet, throwing itself into the guard's throat Throat, with the Pact Maker unable to let go. The body dropped to the ground, and the Pact Maker fled in horror back to Korok's store, which the Breton lived in the top story of. Outside Korok's store, he could see that candles were still lit, and upon entering, he found the man staring directly at him, his eyes glowing the same orange as the dagger had just moments earlier, and his entire body floating above the floorboards. An echoing voice boomed between the ears of the Pact Maker, a voice that only he could hear. I am Clavicus Vile, Daedric Prince of Pax, Rituals and Invocations. Well done on completing your task. Quite unfortunate for your friend Varanus, I must say. The dagger again glowed, this time purple, as a beam of energy transferred itself from the dagger and into the body of the now floating man. His soul is quite powerful, I can feel it. Very useful in my task of creating this mask you so desperately crave. A mask that will bring admiration from all those around you and cover your hideous face. Clavicus Vile let out a manic snigger and the Pact Maker's heart dropped. Not only had he murdered an innocent guard doing his job, but he had slain his old friend and previous mentor, Varanus. To top it all off, his new mentor, someone he considered a friend, was actually the aspect of a Daedric Prince who had been using him for his own satisfaction. The Pact Maker threw his dagger across the room and fell to the ground in tears, helpless in the presence of such a powerful entity. If he were to be killed right there on the floor in Korok's shop, he would just let it happen. Happen. Clavicus continued to speak. Oh, don't make me sad, mortal. I am very close to being able to make your mask, and you are very close to serving life in prison if you're caught for what you've done. I won't let the guards catch you, but you should learn from this experience to be careful what you're offered. You could have just taken any old dagger or even your sword, but instead fear made you take a chance on luck. Never forget that you should try to stick to certainties as much as you can, and only take risks when they're necessary for a big payoff, not just because it feels convenient or beneficial. Surely your father's endeavors have taught you to think things through. Now we've got a business to run, so unless you want to be poor for the rest of your life, I suggest you scuttle on home and get to sleep before tomorrow. I'll make the way safe. The Pact Maker took off the shirt that was soaked in blood and left it in the store. He ran home in a panic, surprisingly didn't see any guards, and came back the next day to find Korok in his mortal form, though now with a much larger smirk than ever before. Korok spoke to the Pact Maker like nothing had happened that night, but the Pact Maker felt terrified the entire time, after realizing that this was, after all, a Daedra he was dealing with. Business had become worse for that general goods store, not just because of the rings, but because someone died there, and this only meant that the citizens of Breville would have to shop elsewhere, like at Korok's. Over the next month, the Pact Maker helped the aspect of a Daedric Prince to maintain a shop, growing ever cautious to his every demand, but enjoying the money that he was being given. He was still mourning the death of Varanus, but over time, he had accepted the blame for it, seeing it as his mistake for taking the lucky dagger, regardless of Clavicus Vile's intentions. He needed to be smarter, and despite realizing he had been groomed for years by a Daedric Prince, the lesson had taught him to be very careful to what he agrees to, and he was grateful for that, though in an understandably bitter way. After a slow month for the rival goods store, all the rings had been sold, and it wasn't long before they were traced back to the owner of the shop with an investigation 
by the court wizard. The week after the knowledge became public, the store was out of operation, and the traffic into Corrick's business was growing fast. Even better for the pact maker, his investment in the store was paying off big time, and he had a nice side income coming in that helped him to save up more than just his usual pay. Eventually, after a long day's work, he came to Corrick asking more about the mask, saying he would pay anything for it. You're going to have to pay with more than coin to get this mask, mortal, said Corrick in his normal voice, before his eyes began to glow orange once again, and the voice of Vile filled the pact maker's ears. I want to see you pay in blood too. Your own blood, that is. You'll notice I have two ornate tankards on the shelf here. Fill them both with it. Secondly, I want another soul. I don't care how you get it, but it must be done. Finally, 1,000 septums, the last ingredient. Then I'll tell you where your mask is. The Pact Maker left with some thinking to do. He wasn't sure how he'd get a soul and really didn't know if he'd survive filling those two tankards with his own blood. They looked fairly large, although before he could think it all through, he arrived home to some bad news. His mother had fallen very ill and was being sustained by a priestess in a comatose state, traced back to one of the rings sold from the general goods store. The father was low on money and bought the ring for a cheap price as it still looked expensive and impressive. The Pact Maker was filled with guilt and dread once again. His brother had also returned home, and was seated next to his mother's bed, with his father by his side. Upon seeing the pact maker walk in, his brother turned to him and said, By the divines, if I knew I was going to see that disgusting thing, I would have buried my guilt of not seeing my mother and left her on her own. Get out of my sight now. The pact maker seethed with rage. He wouldn't take orders from the brother that left the family behind, let alone an order to leave his very own house. His own father was shocked, but said nothing like a coward, simply keeping his gaze to his ill wife. You know what, said the pact maker, how about you meet me in the basement in an hour for a little wooden sword practice and I'll smash that smug look off your face. Nice to see your personality is as charming as your appearance. I'll be there, his brother retorted. The pact maker left the house and went back to Korok's shop. He picked up the lucky dagger he had thrown across the room on that fateful night and attached it to his side. He also wrote up some investment papers for Korok's business, packed a large jar and went back home. Walking inside, he found his father near the kitchen and told him of how he had invested in Korok's shop and things were booming. He suggested that his dad contribute funds as well and after convincing him, he produced the paperwork himself. After doing that, he put the paperwork in his bag and went downstairs to the basement, locking the door behind him. Here, his brother was already practicing with one of their wooden swords, which now looked rather small as they were sized for the children they once were. Perhaps you could say that the pact maker was slightly better, although they were more or less evenly matched. His brother taunted over and over again, and the pact maker could feel his right eye twitching as a rage built up inside him, just as he had planned. This rage would push him to do what he knew needed to be done. Without any hesitation, he grabbed the dagger from his side, which again began to rattle in his hand, and before his brother could do or even say anything, the blade had launched itself straight through his neck. Leaving him on the floor, the pact maker ran to his bag and retrieved the large jar he had brought with him, putting the opening at his brother's neck, draining it until it was full. He escaped out an exit trapdoor and carefully carried the jar in his bag out back to Korok's store. It was dark now and he avoided being seen. Entering the building, the pact maker found Korok yet again floating off the floor with eyes beaming orange. I sense you have brought me what I have asked for, mortal. What is in this bag of yours? The first thing the pact maker did was return the dagger. Then he dropped the contract to the floor beneath Korok's levitating form, and then a large sack of a thousand septums on top. The pact maker explained that his father had signed away his soul to Clavicus Vile upon death without even realizing it. Clavicus Vile was entertained by this trickery, saying that he wanted a soul now, not later, but he would let it pass, for its cunning nature and pure betrayal was very amusing. The pact maker figured his father was a weak man. He lost the family's wealth, and yet he still couldn't take the time to read the fine print. He hadn't treated him like a loving son. He had let his brother disrespect him, but he could still have use living and taking care of his mother during their mortal lives. Also, the pact maker desperately wanted this mask. And now for your blood, mortal. The two tankards levitated across the room, taking place on the floor in front of the contract and the septums. To Vile's surprise, the pact maker pulled out a large jar of blood from his bag and poured it into the tankards, filling them completely. Vile began to laugh, realizing what had happened to the pact maker's identical twin. 
Very clever, mortal. This will do just fine. I must say I was excited to see your face when you drew your own blood. Realizing the amount needed would kill you, but this turn of events is much more exhilarating. Pour one upon the septums and the sealed soul of your father and drink the other. The pact maker was disgusted by the thought, but did it anyway. He had to pinch his nose when he drank and cuffed his lips with his fingers to stop himself from throwing up. Clavicus Vile was loving it and told him his mask lay to the north. He told him to go to Skyrim to Falkreath, telling him he'll know who to follow. He said there you will find your mask, and perhaps even bigger rewards. You'll have plenty of opportunity there with the Civil War, a ripe environment for taking back your birthright, the wealth that your father ripped out from under your family. And so, with a thousand other septums still left to his name, the Pact Maker headed off to Skyrim, taking a ship to the Port of Solitude, which you will be choosing through the use of the alternate Start Live Another Life mod. Now for roleplay in factions. Firstly, in character creation, be sure to cover the face of this Imperial with all kinds of scars and make his face look as damaged as you can. He'll cover it with the mask of Clavicus Vile, which enhances his charisma and hides his face, so you won't see his true appearance in the video. Arriving in Skyrim, the Pact Maker will head to Falkreath, but find nothing there. However, he will quickly learn he is Dragonborn and becomes caught up in fulfilling this destiny. He wants to grow his power by any means he can, giving him the ability to restore his family wealth, for himself of course. You will be role playing that he is making investments wherever he sees profitable, and always has a certain carefulness in his speech and decisions, something instilled deep within him by his father's mistakes and his time with Korik. He will be a master of the fine print, always taking that half second extra to respond to sentences to ensure his wording is absolutely perfect. He's always calm when he speaks, unless of course he's selling something, in which case he's capable of talking up the value and getting a good price. He will develop the skill of trade and barter that Korik built the foundations of, and strive for political influence in every hold, aiming to be Thane. Also, if you want, feel free to console command in those 1000 septums. It makes sense with the backstory, you're a character who has already made an investment which paid off, or maybe have a little bit less because you paid for your voyage to get to Skyrim. So reaching level 10, you'll be able to do Clavicus Vile's quest, so returning to Falkreath, you'll end up meeting Barbus, getting the axe, sparing him, and getting the mask of Clavicus Vile. This hooded variant variant will be used to cover the face of our character, and will be roleplaying that it gives him the admiration of those around him that he has so intensely desired. Clavicus will act like he's never met the Pact Maker before, but will just roleplay that he's just messing with him. Also at level 10, as explained earlier in the video, we'll get 100 points of Magicka as a result of outsmarting Vile in a new Pact. You'll also be able to worship him using the Faith mods we've chosen at this point, taking on actual in-game packs. While looking for lucrative business opportunities, the Pact Maker understands the importance of leverage over others. Despite always having Vile in his ear, he will work with many other Daedra to gain their artifacts simply because they have value. He could bargain or trade them in the future, so the value of artifacts in general will function as part of his motivation for collecting seemingly unnecessary things. We like to think that he would use a deal with one Daedra against another and make this one work out so that this other one can't claim his soul and so on. He will definitely go against Azura's wishes in order to obtain the Black Star. Also, remember Clavicus doesn't want to screw over all of his followers all of the time with every single pact, so he'll only be trying to sometimes. Making pacts with Clavicus Vile is something that the pact maker becomes quite addicted to, and that is why Vile ultimately wins. He remains Vile's plaything, and yearns for the power that fulfilling the pacts brings. The Daedric Prince has an eternity to wait for the pact maker to slip up one day, so he's not stressed if the pact maker outsmarts him today. There will always be another day, another day deal, another opportunity to outwit the shrewd pact maker. If anything, Vile is very entertained by our character's ability to not get screwed over despite often putting him in dangerous situations. This creates a constant low-key anxiety for the pact maker, a background feeling that one day he might slip up, and that could be the end. Also, you'll notice that we summon a Dramora in the play style, and for this spell we're going to roleplay that this ability is actually a reward gained by the pact maker for his calculating nature. Through a variety of pact the Pact Maker was able to entrap this Daedra and make him his indentured servant. The Dramora would love nothing more than to chop his head off, but due to a special deal the Pact Maker made with him, he is obliged to follow all of his commands. 
Such magical packs are made possible by the Pact Maker's new study of conjuration magic in conjunction with the affinity for magic Vile eventually grants him. So the vibe of the role playing is that the Pact Maker is constantly living on the edge in a variety of ways, making different deals as he claws his way to the top financially, politically, and even in combat. In regards to factions, he will join the College of Winterhold to advance his conjuration knowledge, and funnily enough, he will use his ability to leverage deals and acquire power to end up as the Archmage, despite their being many other mages in the college with deeper magical knowledge and more experience than him. Besides doing the main story, he'll also be able to do the Dragonborn DLC, defeating Mirak. You'll also want to gain power in Ravenrock by protecting the higher-ups in House Redoran from the whole House Hlalu Morag Tong plot. You'll explore the Ebony Miners that's sure to bring back money, and you'll even find another rare item inside, the Blood Scar Blade. You'll also invest in the excavation involving Azadal's stuff, of which the payoff will be very worth it. As for the Dawnguard DLC, See, you could join the vampires if you wanted to, but we think the Pact Maker would be concerned that more like Bao might potentially have some sort of claim to his soul and would go against such a risk. Honestly, he'd look cool amongst the ranks of the Dawnguard, and it's a lot safer while still giving him rewards. He knows he'll likely amass power and find artifacts siding against the vampires, and it's true. Think of all the things like Oriel's bow and shield. Joining the Dark Brotherhood doesn't really fit the bill for the skill set of this build, and same thing goes for the Thieves Guild. You could do either of them if you wanted to, but generally they're not factions he'd prioritize. While we know the Thieves Guild can make you rich, he would see how low they had fallen and not be interested. He wants to make big moves, not be a newly employed thug. You will also fight for the Empire in the Civil War, role-playing that he has made many investments in certain industries back in Cyrodiil that will pay off big once he helps them take Skyrim and faith is restored in the faction. Furthermore, you'll want to end up getting the Proud Spire Manor in Solitude, a flashy place to hoard any riches you desire. Also, the Companions Guild isn't his thing either. Finally, feel free to take part in the various quests of the Beyond Skyrim Bruma mod, which is the mod allowing us to get our neat suit of armor. The skills this build will be using are Conjuration, Enchanting, Light Armor, Speech, and One-Handed. One-Handed and Speech will build upon skills already existing in the backstory, whereas Light Armor, Enchanting, and Conjuration are a bit fresher. The Pact Maker considers Light Armor a necessity for combat, allowing him to stay agile as a battle mage while still protecting himself. Himself. Conjuration will be a skill that he trains heavily, although at level 10 he gets some special enhancement from Clavicus File when it comes to his raw magic potential, which is ultimately what makes his desired conjuration use possible. While a bad experience, the Pact Maker saw the power of enchanting with that dagger, but also his ring and eventually the mask, and decides to focus on that skill, believing there is great use in it. As for spells, you'll want the Apocalypse Magic of Skyrim mod for the main ones, which are Conjure, Dramora, Pit Fighter, and Summoning Rune. Both of these Conjuration spells are adept level and serve distinctly unique purposes. The Dramora Pit Fighter that we discussed in the roleplaying section, which I suggest you listen to if you haven't, will be summoned immediately to help cut down your foes in battle, and gains 25% more damage for each nearby enemy. This makes him absolutely savage, especially in doors where the density of enemies is highest. And now Summoning Rune is quite an interesting one. Like all runes, it casts the spell on a nearby surface, and doesn't activate until an enemy triggers it by running over the top of it. What it does is use a portal to teleport the enemy straight to you, putting them in perfect range for your sword strikes, and perhaps even giant battle axe slashes too, depending on where your indebted Dramora is. You can use other summoning spells from Vanilla Skyrim or the Apocalypse Magic mod if you want to have some variety in what you conjure, but try to work it in with the idea that this build really has to try hard, and even make deals to summon powerful things, as is the case with the Dramora Pit Fighter. The Banish Daedra and Expel Daedra spells also fit the themes of Control and Pax. If you want, you can even use Command Daedra. Banish and Expel Daedra both have a chance to banish an enemy conjuration. Expel Daedra is the better option, being an expert spell, and it has a 20% chance to banish a conjuration, but if it fails, it deals 40 damage and staggers the foe. Overall, we thought these spells were cool for the theme of the build, especially if you want to roleplay that you're sending these Daedra directly to Clavicus Vile as part of some deal. However, we'd also recommend using such spells more sparingly than others because the chance of them working isn't super high for what they cost in Magicka. Command Daedra also has a 20% chance to actually work, but instead of banish them, it controls them, so the same logic applies here too. It will stagger the enemy if it fails. However, the controlled Daedra does count as a summon, and because we don't have perks for more than one summon at a time, it will cancel out your Dramora Pit Fighter, so use it wisely 
wisely and only when you think the new summon is worth it, or you're not going to summon the pit fighter until you first try this. Again, these Daedra affecting spells are mostly for roleplaying a character that can be crafty enough to make the Daedra do his bidding, voluntary or not. As for shouts, we like those that could be involved with tricks or deals. For example, you could make a deal that if someone did something for you, you'd let them swing their blade at you without moving, but then use the become ethereal shout to be invulnerable, tricking them and still getting whatever you wanted. Bend will can also be used to allow you to control other powerful targets in battle, which fits the vibes also. Even summon Dernavi on occasion is neat, as he's got his pact with the ideal masters to guard Valerica until death, but then you make it so he can be summoned by you to be used as desired. As for perks, we're using the Ordinator perks of Skyrim mod to overhaul the entire system. We'll show the full list of perks on screen as I explain the most important ones from each skill. From one handed, we have perks to increase damage, critical damage, and reduce stamina cost. However, that's just the basics. More interestingly, we have perks like Clash of Champions, which with three ranks, will actually make our sword attacks reduce our target's attack damage by 20% for three seconds. If such attacks run blocked, then two ranks of the crosscut perk will increase our power attack damage by 50% for four seconds. Speaking of which, Furious Strength will make such power attacks 15% stronger, plus 0.1% more per point of stamina, which is why we've invested in plenty of stamina as explained in the stat section. If you hit enemies with standing power attacks with no more than three seconds in between each, damage will escalate by 15% each time due to Into the Dust. A fourth time even knocks them off their feet. I also really like the Rogue's Parry perk, which allows us to deal 40% more damage and a critical strike when wielding our sword in one hand and nothing in the other if an opponent is winding up an attack or drawing their bow. You'll also have a power attack which deals double damage and costs no stamina after performing eight or more normal one-handed attacks in combat. This is due to the Thundering Blow perk, and with the Aftershock perk, attack speed will be increased by 75% for three seconds immediately after unleashing it. The Light Armor perks are just basic functional ones to keep us sturdier and more agile. Thanks to Unhindered, Light Armor won't slow us down, and with both ranks of Light Armor Mastery, Armor Rating will be increased by 40%. Other light armor perks won't function as desired due to the fact that we're wearing a heavy armor helmet, even if we got that keen senses perk, so don't worry about getting those. Thankfully, we'll have enchanting to buff us up to an even more powerful position. Enchanting perks will take our buffs to the next level, and very importantly, we'll be able to put two on each item due to the twin enchantment perk. You'll even be able to put three enchantments on one item in the game, all of which are 25% stronger through the use of the miracle perk. More on that in the gear section. It's also worth noting that we have the Arcane Nexus perk. You choose to upgrade an Enchanter to an Arcane Nexus for 2,500 gold, and here enchantments will be 25% stronger. You can disassemble it by sneaking and then upgrade an Enchanter somewhere else. From the speech skill tree, we've got some great ones for role-playing. Of course, we've got the basics to make our items sell for more, to be able to sell any item, including stolen goods to any merchant, and have our intimidation attempts four times as likely to succeed. However, we also have more interesting ones, such as business relation. This perk lets you create a bond with the next merchant you speak with, making items you buy from them 30% cheaper. You can choose who you like, but I imagine choosing a person, selling conjuration spells, or enchanting related items would be smart. Kinship will make items 15% cheaper when buying from other Imperials, and with trade prints, every merchant in the game gains a thousand extra gold for bartering, making it quicker to get all that profit from your loot hauls. Probably the best speech perk for role playing is called Investor allowing us to invest 500 gold with a merchant to increase their available gold by 500 permanently. This will help get you on your path to restoring all the wealth you so rightly deserve. Finally, we have Conjuration Perks. Two ranks of Conjuration Mastery will make our spells cost 50% less magicka and make them last 1% longer per level of Conjuration. Dual Casting will make our spells more powerful and will let our Expel Daedra spell affect the strongest Daedra possible. Atromancy will make Summon Daedra last three times as long and five times as long at night. Finally, Summon Resist is a more significant perk. This makes our Conjured Daedra within 75 feet gain 50% magic resistance and 300 points of armor. As for the main play style, it should be fairly straightforward by now. In the beginning of battle, you'll want to summon your Dramora Pit Fighter, placing it in enough range of as many enemies as possible, so long as that's safe, to benefit from the increased attack damage. Don't stay too far away from him, as the Imperial Race Bonus Discipline will give allies within 15 feet an additional 15% attack damage and 150 more points of armor rating. If you want to try banishing any Daedra, now is a good time to do so. If you want to try and control a Daedra, do it before summoning your 
your own, usually. Then use your summoning rune spell in one hand and your sword in the other to bring enemies towards you and barrage them with a combination of normal attacks and power attacks. Remember, you'll also be able to benefit from not having a spell in that left hand at all. So once you've exhausted the desire to use conjuration spells, be sure to use just the sword on its own and even block with it using two hands. In this mode, you'll benefit from Rogue's Parry, giving you a chance to deal more damage if you hit an enemy while they're winding up that power attack or drawing their bow. Remember that if you're low on stamina or magicka or both, you can use that Colovian star power once a day to refill them both, bringing back your power. Don't forget to use dragon shouts as desired, such as Bend Will or Summon Dernavir to really control the battlefield. As for gear, we will be looking like quite a unique but distinctly Cyrodiilic battle mage, with a classic traditional sword in one hand, a conjuration spell emanating from the other, and a neat suit of protective chainmail topped off with a mysterious hood, covering nothing less than the powerful mask artifact gifted to you by a Daedric Prince. The chainmail armor boots and braces come from the Beyond Skyrim Bruma mod, the hooded version of the Mask of Clavicus File comes from the hooded Clavicus File Mask mod, and the Duke Sword comes from the Immersive Weapons mod. On top of this, we're going to use an enchanted necklace and a ring of your choice. On the necklace, we'll use the Miracle Perk to have three enchantments, which will be Fortify Conjuration, One-Handed, and Barter. On the chest piece, we'll have Fortify Conjuration and Stamina, and on the braces, we'll have Fortify One-Handed and Magicka. On the boots, we'll have Fortify One-Handed and Frost Resistance, and on the ring, we'll have Fortify Conjuration and One-Handed. Interestingly, on our sword, we're going to take that damage even further by adding a Chaos Damage and Fiery Soul Trap enchantment. The Soul Trap will help recharge the weapon through the use of the Black Star Artifact. While not a smithing character, you'll want to smith up your armor and sword as best as you can before enchanting them to help make you sturdier and deal more melee damage. The hooded mask simply replaces the normal one, and you'll want to download the version that increases Magicka regeneration from 5 to 15% to make it even stronger. It'll still make prices 20% better, with speech increased by 10% on top. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes another Skyrim build, The Pact Maker. Remember to subscribe to make a deal with Clavicus File to get more Elder Scrolls content in your life, and let us know what kind of build you want to see next. Thank you for tuning in, and be sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. As always, social media links can be found in the description if you're interested, along with timestamps to help you navigate back to various sections. My name is Michael, thanks again for watching, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.